Maybe this is why we also have a pub meeting at the end. The idea is that we can actually discuss this together as well, um, because I suspect quite a few of you um, who are, have joined us are also in practice and would like to uh, maybe share and brainstorm about some of these issues and particular issues that you come across. Um, so as a reminder, in part one and uh, part two, I mainly focus on three key priorities that I think are very important for sustainability in housing design. The first one was climate change impacts. The second one was that um, of the importance of the current lack of holistic design. Um, and that's, of course, related to housing quality and quality of life. And then the third priority was um, us as architects um, understanding um, how our buildings and our designs work in reality. And as I also said, there's so many other priorities that um, when we do these short kind of talks, um, we sort of have to focus on a few key points to uh, hopefully be have some coherence on them. But other priorities um, you know, are equally important, such as aging population, degrowth in some cities, problematic housing stock that needs adjusting and improving, resource issues, and so forth. Um, but so this part really um, likes to capture what are the barriers and how can we overcome these challenges together. So very briefly, if buildings are associated with 36% of CO2 emissions and we as architects are involved in the design of uh, many buildings, then we have a profound responsibility, of course, related to climate change. And it's not incomparable, perhaps, to the oil crisis um, or the energy crisis from 50 years ago, where also architects really had to step up of um, you know, how our cities are designed and our buildings are designed. And particularly in Europe and the United States, um, there's several architects who started to experiment and research ways to reduce energy use and particularly by developing passive systems, triple glazed windows and other technologies, including co-living and social experiments um, as well. And that also was really the start of super insulated home experiments like Passive House. Um, there's no time to really show you some examples of this, um, but if you're interested, I can always um, give you some direction on that later. But the key message from this is, is that this all happened in the 70s and the oil crisis was sort of averted and these experiments never became mainstream. And we just didn't do enough. And a lot of us architects didn't engage uh, with it. So instead, we ended up and still are designing buildings that are very reliant on technology, um, that then use fossil fuels. And that allows us, of course, to control these buildings uh, quite significantly so that we can actually build buildings with little consideration uh, of local climate, resources, or even people. And so we've created this legacy of air conditioned spaces, both in winter and summer. And also buildings are often very complex to use and maintain. We over rely on artificial lighting. This is particularly not so much a problem in housing, although when we then have, as I said, in the first uh, part of the talk, we have these deep plan housing plans. We also have actually issues there about um, reliance on artificial light. And of course, it has implications for health and well-being as well, and not just an energy issue. And there's also often a lack of occupant thermal comfort. Um, these buildings then cost a lot of money to run and could create energy poverty in homes whereby residents have to choose between eating or heating. Um, in Finland, this is less so of an issue, um, although as I raised also in part one, it's a question if this will change in summer, if buildings overheat and people cannot afford to cool their buildings in heat waves. And so we're also building our buildings from high impact and often wasteful materials as well. And so all of this has this significant impact on the environment as usually fossil fuels are used to operate the building. And then we have these large CO2 emissions as a result, and then that's contributing to the climate crisis. So no surprise that buildings and, uh, and cities and both the operation and the construction have such a significant impact, uh, just over a third of the CO2 emissions in Europe. So we've been clearly been part of the problem and therefore we must also be part of the solution. Now, why haven't we been more part of the solution or what are some of the barriers is something that I really would like to explore a little bit more, particularly how we can make a change in reality, in real life um, and in practice and, and with our both projects. And I'm highlighting um, 
some key barriers um, that I'm aware of from my perspective and my kind of lens as uh, an academic and somebody who, who um, you know, finished traditional architectural practice 10 years ago, but I still until two years ago, I was involved still as a consultant in an industry as um, also a researcher and a consultant, uh, an environmental designer. So the first one I would say is lack of knowledge. Um, that's particularly a problem in practice, but also in education. The second one is a lack of integrated design process. And by the way, I'll go through each of these and give you some examples and I'll, I'll you know, as what the solutions might be. So I'm just setting out what I think are the key barriers that I identified. Um, the third one is also that of lack of collaboration. The fourth one, perhaps a little bit controversial, is that I think that we lack um, a creative way of thinking about our own role as architects. And then another big one, which I think often architects blame clients uh, for the, you know, sort of the lack of sustainable housing uh, or other building design is that of buy-in or support by clients and developers so that they're not really pushing the agenda forward as well. So, and then hopefully in a discussion, I would like to see if we can add to this list or, or what your experience is, which some are bigger barriers than others, for example. So I'm gonna go through each of these five barriers and give you some examples of how we might be able to overcome some of these, so what solutions um, might exist and give you some examples as well in some cases. So as I said, the first one identified is that lack of knowledge. And I would just like to briefly read this quote by Scott McCauley, who is a Scottish um, master's student. And he wrote in the Architectural Journal the following, our next generation of architects will be working within a climate that we cannot predict and an understanding of architecture's place within environmental cycles, its effect on human health, the implications of the materials we build with and the necessity for retrofit skills are only going to rise in importance. This is a knowledge that we must foster and uptake in. For the sake of people and the planet, students must be inspired and taught to design climate responsive architecture as a standard. And when you uh, read the rest of the article, Scott then goes to unfold how little this is taught, both knowledge, the skills, but even to think about these issues in his architecture education and across that most of Europe um, in particular. So how do we overcome that? Well, clearly we need to have upskilling and education. And this is not just students need to study these things, but therefore tutors need to teach these things. And that also means that teachers need to also upskill so that they're able to teach those issues as well. And then, of course, the future graduates, they end up in practice. Um, and if they don't have that knowledge, we have this, this perpetuating problem of, uh, you know, students or young graduates going to practice, they don't have the knowledge, don't bring the knowledge into practice. And the people in practice didn't have that knowledge because they studied many years before, or then only gather that knowledge for very specific projects uh, as they come across it or if a client kind of request certain uh, uh, criteria. So we need to really upskill as architects on energy literacy. We need to upskill on how buildings perform in reality and how we might go about finding out about that. So how do we monitor buildings? How do we gain feedback from users in buildings? And we also need to understand these um, interconnections, uh, you know, and this holistic kind of sustainability issues, because it's no longer good enough that we design a building that is not high standard in all sustainability values. So, and I can't stress this enough, that the time is really over whereby we can say that um, a building uh, has really, um, for example, has undertaken a lot of community participation, so it ticks very high boxes on social sustainability, but hasn't really considered the resources it's built from, and then to claim it is a sustainable building is actually um, problematic. Um, and that's just one example. Um, we need to understand also the co-benefits of CO2 reduction, um, so that when we are reducing CO2 reduction comes forth from reducing energy use, that means that actually people have more money to spend on other things rather than on their energy bills, but also health and well-being, therefore are usually positively impacted and so on. So these are all very interconnected components um, and we need to understand that and we come back to that in the final point so we can make that argument to our clients as well, why sustainable uh, tomorrow matters so much. So then the lack of integrated design process. Um, I'm really convinced, um, not only reflecting on my own practice and when my students are designing, but 
we really undertake and should undertake a different design process when we're doing sustainable design. And it means that we need to think about many more issues, particularly context and some critical moves in our design very early on, rather than as an afterthought when we go to for planning permission or when we have a discussion with the city planner. So this has to come right at the front when often we would move this right to the back. We need to involve experts sooner because of that. Um, we also need to make sure we ask the right questions, but also at the right time in the design process. And often we ask these questions very late in the design process, and then actually our fee does not allow to make changes or reflect on this and make design changes throughout. Um, and therefore we need a more integrated and also an iterative design process, so why we go back and forth a lot more and that we really integrate sustainable design thinking. And so that's why we need to teach and practice differently. As an example, and I know this is not, this is a simplification of the design process, but I think often as, as architects, we get the background, we do research, we develop the brief of the client, we come up with an architectural vision, as you can see here, so it's quite a linear process. Then we come up with the design solutions or an end product and the building gets built. And yes, of course, it's, at moments we're not so linear, we might have some design iterations, so we go back and forth between the vision and the, the final solution, particularly we'll get input from the city planners or from uh, the client at this stage. But the real issue is, is that often climate considerations and energy issues and building services don't get considered until the very end, sometimes or very often after the building has actually already got approval to be built um, by the city. And that's, of course, very problematic because if we don't include experts and this thinking more holistically very early on, it's actually very hard to integrate sustainability aspects at later stages because it's going to be very costly. Also, we have our, you know, our time frame that we promise to deliver projects in. And then it's very, very difficult because we would delay that process, basically. So getting that much earlier on is super important. And of course, the problem is, is that we still teach design as this linear, almost more linear process. Um, particularly this, this sort of second component of design iterations is often something that students don't have time to undertake or also think that the first solution they come up with is actually the final built product or in their case, their submission. Um, and so it's, it's actually also still prevailing in practice as a result as well. And um, instead, I like to think of a more circular design process. And I've used this with some of my students uh, in Sheffield University, also in Denmark, and um, only very briefly with some of our students in fourth year architecture last semester. And we start at step one, as you can see. So the idea is, is that you bring a lot of the sustainability issue right to the foreground. So all that contextual research should then feed into the vision. And from that vision, we can set objectives and then for those objectives, we can find solutions and then we validate or test these solutions. And then when the building's built, we go and check if actually these objectives in our vision have been met, if it actually works. And so I refer to this as seven steps to sustainable architecture. It's a much more integrated approach. And seeing at Connebro at Hen Larsen in Denmark, um, they use on many of their projects, I'm not sure if it's on all, pretty much a process like this. I think actually they have five steps. So we developed this together, um, you know, when she was a guest professor in, in Sheffield, we ended up building on, on um, kind of the methods that she uses. And I really recommend on ISU, there's a free publication called Designing with Knowledge Approach, because it's very interesting uh, read. And it also explains some of the way that they work and think and so on. Um, just I wanted to briefly pause perhaps with this issue of validation and testing because if we go back, sorry, if we go back to this model, we don't tend to, so we tend to have the vision, we design, we might have some iterations, it gets built. And this point of the validation here is that um, we are actually ourselves going back to check whether what we set out to do, our vision, our objectives are actually met. And that can be through architectural drawings, but it can also be through environmental modeling or energy modeling or also just through very simple diagrams that we actually just double check whether we have achieved what we set out to do at the very beginning. And an example, this is just one of several examples, um, but I chose to, to show you um, some work back here in Timberlake. And this is particularly uh, under Billy Faircloth, who's the head of research there. She also uh, teaches at Harvard uh, University and they're very much designed with knowledge. 
So they use research, they actually have a research group. Um, they also do physical and computer modeling, they prototype. They have, for example, not just architects in their research uh, office uh, or like unit, if you like, um, but they have uh, building physicists, material scientists, they might have anthropologists working uh, about user satisfaction and so on. And so in this case, what you're looking at on the left is actually uh, a map of a roof. So this is a roof plan with all these little boxes identify different kind of uh, species of, of green roof plants and how they might be planted. And then they actually went back the, the little um, you know, mapping, monitoring on the right with hand drawing. Uh, that then shows you uh, what they actually found uh, in reality, what had survived after some time. And you can see them here in action as well, where they, when they were then actually the ecologist was going in to check if things really work. So this is that validation and that, you know, in the very early stage, you have this validation of, you know, really the plans and they go on service as that feedback process and the valid that follows from the validation process. So um, third one was lack of collaboration. Um, we very much work in silos still too much in architecture and simply put, a building isn't built on its own, but particularly sustainable buildings cannot be achieved um, on just one architect does it or an architecture practice does it. And we really need to elevate the input from engineers, ecologists, expert users. Uh, by that I mean, for example, the local community are going to use the spaces and we actually can really give us some useful information. Also facility and estate managers, other expert consultants, uh, client uh, and so on. And we need to also acknowledge our own strengths and weaknesses and we need to team up then with those people that can complement our expertise because we cannot afford to get it wrong and we also cannot afford both fees wise but also in time in the project it takes a long time to become an expert at something and it doesn't make much sense that we're spending our our fees on becoming an expert at something that actually we could team up with other people and learn from them and work together with them. It's a much more effective way and we're less likely to get things wrong and build then unsustainable buildings despite our best intentions. And so we need to also team up early on in the design process and I hope that was clear from the previous kind of barrier as well that we actually need their input very early on so that we can still make those changes when they come in and tell us what the best um, kind of design uh, solutions are. And of course, what we learn should also be openly shared so we can all collectively learn and progress uh, as a profession as well. And um, interestingly, quite a few architects are acting as collaborators. This uh, project is um, one actually Reba National Award in the UK. It's Peter Salter, who was actually one of my professors when I was at East London as a student. And his, I think his first project, um, he's built in Japan before, his first project that he built in the UK as a design architect. Um, and, but it's of course very complex, the regulations are quite, um, you know, quite strict in the UK. So he teamed up as a design architect with mall architects that are technical architects that can achieve high performing buildings. Um, and so there's actually one project, two architects practices are involved in this. And so we need a lot more of this teaming up and collaborating and complementing each other. And the other two, two of the uh, three projects I showed in the in part two actually did exactly that. So this is uh, Chester Balmore, where Archetype did the energy modeling in house, they refined the design to the low energy standard and made sure that they, with the design architect, uh, could actually um, build a quite complex passive house standard. And then on one Brighton by feeling like Bradley, they ended up teaming up for building performance and use studies, particularly, and public sharing so that we could all collectively learn. So they were working with UCL Energy Institute uh, and with uh, civil engineers and environmental engineers and also then people who are very well versed uh, in building physics and monitoring and so on. Um, so you can see that there was all sorts of different partners involved to deliver this building and go back and fix certain issues that then came up. And the fourth barrier is that of lack of creative thinking and the one that I, that I think might be perhaps a little bit um, controversial because of course as architects we are trained to think creatively about our clients' um, site, uh, their brief, the problems that we're trying to solve but somehow we don't think very creatively I think about our own role um, and we often stick to what has already been done in a certain way in our profession and we just keep doing that, what has been done forever. 
And that means um, that actually we miss some opportunities. And I think particularly a current discussion that is really starting to happen, which I think is very interesting and a huge opportunity for us as architects, is to acknowledge that we as architects are not just architects, but we're also part of a global community and we're global citizens. And we also have responsibilities as global citizens. And in a way, I would like to see a culture change whereby we see ourselves both as architects, but also as global citizens that we bring into our architecture in this interconnected world, rather than sort of leave that behind us when we, you know, come into the office. And because if we don't do that, we then fail to put some of these global issues and responsibilities at the heart of our projects. Um, so doing things differently really matters because it helps us individually but also collectively as a profession to move forward and the question is really where are we best placed to make a difference as architects is that really as a design architect or as a technical architect or is it as an educator or not for example when I considered myself uh, when I worked in practice um, as a project architect of um, low energy and sustainable housing um, I would spend four or five years mostly on one main project. I would be involved in some other competitions with advice on sustainability on other projects. But I got frustrated that I was making such little impact for such great effort and energy that I was putting into because the way that projects in you know, the whole design process takes so long. So I ended up, when I really considered how can I make the biggest difference, which is what mattered most to me, I decided to leave traditional practice for academia so I could actually teach more future architects to then make these changes in practice, um, you know, that they themselves could actually build more sustainable projects. And I think us reflecting on where are we best placed, what do we want to achieve is something that we probably don't do often enough in the profession because we have sort of a very specific role uh, set for us in a specific profession that everybody is obviously um, kind of engaged with. So, seeing ourselves as global citizens can also help us to position ourselves and have a vision for ourselves and the kind of architecture we want to create. So, I actually think that not only can our actions positively influence society, but it can actually also really help us position ourselves as architects and create a clear identity in practice and, and give a competitive edge, for example. And so, it's about us being acting as architects, also as global citizens in our own practice and not just leaving, as I said, at the office door. Um, some examples, um, this is Helen and Hard uh, in Norway, and they're really trying to always renew. So, um, this is a housing project, it's uh, co-developed and it's, um, they also are part um, uh, developers, the so owners of the site, actually some of them live there now and they developed it with local community and literally from design development and actually living there but they also have an amazingly interesting bank um, that they designed in Stavanger which is also uh, quite unusually out of timber construction so they really try to always position themselves as, um, as architects with a global uh, responsibility. Nonconform in Austria have positioned themselves from very much award-winning um, design practice that then got heavily critiqued for being very top-down with what the community wanted, that they really then got involved with the community. And actually now they're architects that very much facilitate other architects' projects where they are the community facilitator. And they've really come up with these idea and where they and methods how to engage the local community. And that's where they've decided they can make the biggest difference uh, in kind of sustainable building. RAM Labor, if you're not familiar with them, they're really worth looking into as well. But they really also think that a lot of architecture doesn't have to be huge um, landmark buildings only, but they also have a lot of very small change making in the local community and often with the local community and thinking about resources and material very creatively as well. Um, Architecture Auto Jure, they're based in Paris. They also work very closely with the community, but they're actually more like, um, so they co-design with the community, but also very much activist architects as well. So they really use a lot of their architecture to critique city plans. This is an example here whereby um, for this housing block, there was um, uh, the, uh, a site was demolished and then was left to rubble in the recession. And then they took that over for the community, built a local pavilion with the community, and then made a food growing place um, for the temporary nature of that. It's since moved elsewhere when they've taken over this plot for car parking, unfortunately. But they really get politically engaged uh, with the community to make a difference and support the community that way. And then in um, 
also in sustainable architecture, there's a fair bit of research uh, going on. As I mentioned before, Kieran Timberlake and Billy Fairclough's work, that they do a lot of material testing, prototyping. They created uh, software themselves for uh, um, a whole life costing or life cycle assessment rather. Um, they work also with universities um, and so they made their own loggers. So they actually really try to get involved with a lot of these things. And I think what's interesting is that when we are innovating and coming up with new ideas, I think then it's particularly important to monitor and to keep track of what it is we're doing so that we know that these things might actually have a chance of, of having the impact, positive impact we expected them to have. And I gave this example as well. This is by Lenager Group. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening around the circle economy. And is that really the, the question of doing things in a different way and building in a different way and experimenting and taking some risks um, and particularly around the circle economy in Denmark, very interesting things happening. This is Van Kunsten where they're also doing local tests with new cladding and clay materials. And also GXN who are working with uh, kind of leftover tomato um, stems and using that then as a new bio-based material, uh, manufacturing new materials that way and really thinking outside the box as well. And finally, I think there need to be more of us architects that act as clients that are not just designers, but they can really affect change because then you are hiring and you set the brief and you're hiring then the architects and can steer the architects towards more sustainable uh, environments and sustainable developments as well. And this is an example of an ex-student and a, a business partner of mine, amazing Stephen Choi, who's um, the Living Future Institute Executive Director in Australia, and he's also the Living Building Challenge Manager at Fraser's Property, so he works alongside the client. And he's actually standing on top of the roof of a uh, retail centre where they all are actually growing their own food, composting, and so on, built to um, the Living Building Challenge standard. We've got some other um, initiatives like um, Architects Declare uh, and they Declare the Climate and Biodiversity Emergency, also Architecture Education Declares. And altogether, these have received, I think it's now uh, over 5,000 signatures uh, together. And in uh, Finland, I'm trying to establish a climate action network in uh, particularly the Nordic and Baltic regions. So if you're interested, do get in touch, email me. We are trying to plan a meeting on the 12th of June where we have uh, Architects Climate Action Network from London calling in and uh, telling us all about it. So I guess my main message for this barrier and how we can solve it is that first and foremost, we're actually global and local citizens. And perhaps, and this is why it's controversial, architects second, yet somehow we leave our global citizens at citizenry uh, behind at the door of the architect's office. So I think we need to do things differently and I would like to see us contaminate our architectural persona and our designs with our citizen responsibilities. And then finally, the one that I think most of us always think about when we think of barriers is that of lack of buy-in by clients and developers into our projects. And of course, a lot of buildings are built that don't involve architects. So we're only involved in a fraction of buildings. And clients might also be very resistant to change, um, but I don't think that as architects, it lets us off the hook. Um, and so I think that, um, first of all, often architects perceive sustainable design as more expensive. In some cases it is, um, but it doesn't have to be, especially if we use more integrated design processes. So when we move a lot of that thinking early on, we don't do abortive work, or also it doesn't then cost a lot of money to fix things when actually uh, they should have been thought of from the beginning. We need to base our design on evidence. We need to include a lot more passive design and right from the beginning, get that right. We need to include experts early on. And I also think that we need to go away from discussions with the design team and the client talking about the capital cost, but actually we need to talk about cost benefit analysis and whole life cycle costing. So. That means that we're not just talking about how much something costs, but how much it costs over time. So what are the maintenance costs? What are the replacement costs? What are the costs to the residents' health and well-being? Um, so that this isn't just this sort of very short uh, capital cost uh, kind of figure that we put on things. Um, for example, I worked on a project, um, this is now quite some time ago in London, whereby we had integrated, um, so basically when you, when you design green roofs, then you don't need as many uh, rainwater pipes. 
um, for runoff of water and the quantity surveyor had come back to reduce the cost on the scheme and had scrapped the green roofs. But the fact that we as architects really understood the uh, interconnection, we could immediately go back and say, well, we now have a problem because we've already started on site doing all the groundworks and the drainage. And if we don't have green roofs anymore, we need a lot more rainwater pipes. So we ended up keeping our green, uh, our green roofs because when they calculated the cost of including now extra drainage, extra rainwater pipe, they realized that there wasn't going to be a cost saving. But we can only do this when also we as architects have that knowledge and create that argument and can have that discussion that is informed with the client, with the other experts, with the quantity surveyors and so on. So without that knowledge, it's very hard for us to persuade the client and the developer about the co-benefits of these aspects and how things are so interconnected. So the other thing is also, how can we expect to be taken seriously as architects that we ask our clients to step up, to take a position about sustainability and to act as global citizens when we fail to do it ourselves, when we don't practice what we preach um, to the clients. And so all of this is really connected to all of the other themes above and in the previous parts as well that I think um, it's very important that we get that story straight. So I think as architects, we should champion and use our power of persuasion to go beyond what the minimum required standards are. Um, and clearly, architecture should evolve with the changing needs in the world, and we need to practice but also teach differently. And we can no longer be part of the problem. And I hope that, that has been quite convincing in the last kind of sort of in, in these three kind of short, brief snippets of, of my talks. And I think the most powerful thing to remember is, is that we can be part of the change that is needed. And that was what I sort of whisked through. Um, it's a little bit strange because I'm just seeing my slides. I can't see any of you or who's on this call at all. But I just wanted to say thank you. Um, thank you, Safa, for inviting me. And I would like to now go to questions. But I have some questions for you as well. But first questions for me or, you know, open discussion. Um, the questions I might have for you is what are the barriers you perceive, what needs to be done, and how can we solve them together? But um, perhaps now I stop screen sharing. What do you think, Pipsa? And I can come back and maybe see something else but my own screen. What do we think? Yes, yes, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. And, and the other thing is, is that we'll take a refreshment. Yes, do that too. Hi, Sophie. Hi. Uh, Thank you for joining us. On, it's, it's beautiful weather, I imagine, in Helsinki too, no? It is really nice, yes. Yeah. Thank you for, for taking time out. I wish you were now sitting in the garden. <laughs> so. Well, looking at it anyways. So. You're looking at it, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a nice series, really thought-provoking, and, and hopefully I, I also uh, can and, uh, sort of... Um, give some my ideas to the questions that you mm -hmm. gave gave it, it really seems to me that the, the biggest transformative change that has to happen first is in the attitudes and and also in yeah. our attitudes and yeah and and sort of this uh uh lack of creative thinking and lack of collaboration and also the need of inspiration sort of uh uh seems to me that it has a relation to the to the point that you uh, made in the first part about the the very pragmatic thinking that we tend to have towards environment and you you had the the case of uh, spaces in between yeah there uh, yeah. which was yeah. nice that you made that point because uh, that's what i've been also arguing that in finland we particularly tend to be really pragmatic to us those but but these these uh, spaces they they also uh, sort of reveal quite uh, important uh, sort of uh, difficulties in this thinking uh, it seems that we see them as as really as as that we need to have the they are compulsory and we don't recognize the potentials in in these spaces yeah. And and uh, and uh, the potentials that are sort of outside the necessary functionality, uh, we we can't recognize that those and 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 uh, and for this uh, lack of recognition, we are really re ready to cause uh, 
sort of waste in the material resources in biodiversity, by di biodiversity, uh, but also uh, sort of uh, compromises to to, to uh, how, how the places are in, in their uh, uh, sort of atmosphere and functionality and, and for the well-being well aspects. Uh, and, and all these sort of waste and uh, neglect just to avoid the, the trouble and labor that comes, comes if, if we sort of open up the thinking. Uh, the, and also the messiness and inconveniences that come if, if, if those spaces would be something else and they would provide more, more to the people who use them. The, the human collaborate, collaboration that, that sort of becomes necessary when, when they are not no longer just asphalt and, and, and uh, green uh, grass, but something that is functional and social and usable. And, and in this, this regard, we really can see that there is a need for this transformative change in the attitudes. Uh, so, so this environment shouldn't be thought like it's maintenance free mm -hmm. and the buildings that, that, that also, also are built, they are not maintenance free uh, and, and the labor of maintenance is not something that, that should be avoided, but, but something that is part of this environmental uh, sustainable way of uh, building and living in the environment. And also something that connects the, the labor of maintenance connects people to the environment and creates better uh, relations to the to, to between uh, self and environment and sort of bet, more sustainable relationship to to, to it. Uh, and and the points uh, you had the holistic uh, spheres in the first lecture also. Which, uh, which are really, of course, quite uh, familiar uh, to me also from from early earlier because we do work together and we yeah. have been drawing those different yeah. bubbles uh, in in many many occasions. But in this uh, th this time, I sort of uh, started to think that it is uh, the the thing that connects all the bubbles or spheres uh, is the perspective of equality. Mm -hmm. the, the failures on each of the bubbles in, in biodiversity or, or in, in uh, uh, resource, uh, resources or health and well-being or affordability, they, they all cause inequality on some aspects. Yeah. And, 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 and the value base that, that uh, is needed for this radical rethinking, then should actually be based on, on this equality. And, and I like that you too, you came up with this global citizenship because it, that is really yeah. something that is, uh, yeah. to me, is strongly uh, connected to, to equality thinking and the political engagement in that. And all, all this sort of uh, seems to be a really like a circular, circular uh, thinking that uh, that that everything is is connected. But the the sort of the base needs to be found first. Mm -hmm. uh, that can open the thinking and 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 sort of uh, get rid of the overly pragmatic ideas of of and 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 also the linear linear design. I think in this is global connected to that uh, sort of similar pragmatism in, in thinking. Yeah, that's a nice summary. Um, is it, Pipsa, you're not recording, are you recording this still? No. I am recording, yes. Okay, so good, so we have that. <laughs> because, <laughs> yes, I, I don't know, and I'd love to hear from some others. If others did want to jo join in, feel free. Mm. Of course, it's in English. I'm so sorry, I do not speak any Finnish yet, and might not do for a while. Um, so I know that it's a little bit of a barrier, but otherwise, as Pipsa was saying, you can put it in the chat box. But I, I think this um, this attitude change, this culture change that Katya you're pulling up on, I think is, is yeah, that's sort of what I'm realizing more and more that 
for a long time it was like let's just throw knowledge at, at architects more knowledge you know so they can do things differently but if we keep on thinking as you say very pragmatically about things and not very interconnected then we think it's a sustainable building but actually it isn't and i think if we can change that attitude that things are interconnected um, like I had a discussion earlier today and I thought, damn, I should, sorry, I shouldn't swear, this is recorded. <laughs> I, I realized like, I, that it was in the foreground of my mind that was saying, yes, and in Finland, it's so true, this pragmatic nature of the spaces between buildings. And then said, and actually it's a real problem with particularly if Helsinki is predicted to become to the climate of Copenhagen by the end of the century, all that asphalt is not only very nice when you have your short piers, but it makes all of it worse, the, the overheating and the impact and so all of this is very interconnected you know and it is about that the attitude and that culture change in that sense um but yeah and i think if we if i i struggled a little bit i thought it was a bit of a risk putting in global citizenship because i also think it's also at a local level and i was like is a local global <laughs> because i think when we talk about um climate change of course very global because it's connected but it also has all of these local connections and impacts as well so i see them the global citizenship i don't necessarily mean the world but it is both you can look at it as the world but also global is in more our community so it's more broad that, that citizenship and that responsibility that we have and that shifts all the time our responsibility um but yeah but i think particularly um uh, yeah, we, we, we do a lot on sustainable construction, but it doesn't necessarily lead to sustainable architecture if then it is a building that technically performs but socially doesn't work or over time might overheat or it doesn't have the, the and didn't consider the resources and as you said, the maintenance over time that I think if we go back and check how the buildings work, it also brings in that there is, a, it isn't just finished and at its best before people are in it, it's, people are part of that, you know. And, and actually, it should be built for people and not just so that we can put it in our portfolio. Um, it isn't for our self-aggrandizement. Some of us still think of it that way when you look at how many pictures of projects are taken with never a single person. And as if a person will ruin the, uh, what's the word, ruin the... Um, the balance of the image or the the kind of uh, the, the the constellation of the architecture or you know there's something out of place almost when there's a person in it or there's uh, some of these objects in there that does that like their day-to-day -day living um and i think it's it's all part of that attitude that i would like to see change and that i hope to bring as well to finland particularly with the next generation of architects we educate um, that so, yeah. sounds good actually I'd like to get on the point that uh, you said that the spaces between buildings are really important and that goes really to my heart because actually I'm a landscape architect, mm -hmm. uh, architect and I see that uh, my profession it's it's quite alike like an architect but um, it, well it's the spaces outside so that like you said if you use only asphalt the main problem comes with with like runoff water, water and what to do with that. So if we're just like, okay, put on the roads and stuff. So uh, with greenery and uh, good landscape design, we can also like contribute to sustainable, sustainable living environment. Mm -hmm. and, and during this, like, uh, especially this spring, we've all noticed how important it is to that you have your your like own park you can go and, and hang yeah. out with the pandemic yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's really important but uh, i actually had one other point uh, i was talking with han earlier today he's the chair of this housing committee we have at safa safa he said that they've been discussing a lot about uh, regulations concerning housing and and they're good and bad sides so um he was wondering what is like your position on on regulations should there be more should there be less are the regulations like the new standards standards yes yeah, yeah i think regulations is really um a very interesting one because I, I, and I sort of take two, two takes on it. So my first immediate response would be, we need regulations, otherwise, so that we create a level playing field for all the architects, clients, and developers. Because 
if we don't have a minimum standard, then we're going to get a lot of terrible stuff built. The problem is then that a lot of um, companies and developers are very good at lobbying to get then the minimum standards very low <laughs> and not great, which then means that we still don't have great buildings, but they need the minimum regulation. And then following on from that, we end up as architects often, we said, oh, but it, it look, it's sustainable or it's good housing because it needs the regulations. But actually, I have to keep pointing out, meeting the regulations is the worst you can get away with in your designs. This is not best practice. It's not good practice. It's the worst you're allowed to have. So we should always, as architects, aim far way beyond the regulations. And so I would love to see regulations being really ambitious. So if we have ambitious regulations, it makes a level playing field for everybody. And that means that suddenly, um, when one, we get economy of scale in construction, um, you know, because everybody has to abide by it, we start innovating within it because we have to find solutions to, to do this, uh, you know, on the construction side, but also in a, in a financially viable way. But it also means that the companies uh, will just model it in their business model and they're competing at a level footing. The problem I have, so I'm all for regulations, but I think often they're so minimal that actually then the reverse happens. And as I said, people then go, oh, look, it's great, our building, but actually it's not even best practice because it's the lowest we can get away with. It's the worst we can get away with. And then that's what our... Uh, that's what sort of then our objective becomes, which is the opposite of what I think we should be doing. Like we should be going way above the regulations as architects and exceed them. And and so in a way, um, as architects, we should we should just design sustainable buildings so that they always meet the regulations because they always exceed the minimum criteria. We should go above and beyond that. But yeah, the difficulties, again, it comes back to that culture of, of like, if also we then have clients that is really like, what's the least we can get away with is then a bit of an issue. Um, so, yeah, so I think we need regulations, but I would want them to be much more ambitious so that we can actually really lift up what we need to do and everybody's at a level playing field and we get a lot better housing um, as a result because we also lock in, I mean, our buildings stand for the next, hopefully, 40, 50, 60, 70 more years. And if we're not careful, we're otherwise locking in badly performing and bad housing design for a very long time to come if we don't get that right. So I don't know, Katya, what do you think being in practice still and there's other people here as well might have an opinion on this about the regulations. Yeah. And we have been, uh, I've been also in the discussions with, with Hannu, Hannu on these mm. subjects. And I think that the sort of the difficulty or the really problematic uh, moment becomes uh, sort of when the regulations sort of fix uh, the business as like, usual way of yeah, being. Exactly. Sort of, uh, with yeah, the connected really linear uh, yeah. process thinking and, 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 and when they don't uh, uh, in the regulations have this circular thinking that yeah. The regulations would also sort of learn yeah. and adapt to different situations. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. It's not at all easy question. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in in a way. Uh, do I understand correctly? You're also referring to this idea that it can really lock us in then in a way of doing it, and then we're not going to do much else because that's what now we're supposed to do. Yeah. In a way, even I think you said quite clearly, sort of locks us in. It's quite sort of straightforward, linear, and we just follow that, and we don't ask any questions or look for other solutions. Yeah. 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 Pours concrete to the. This is the solution that has been always done. Yeah. So let's continue. Yeah. It always requires like you have the minimum level. Level. That's like a, like okay. It becomes the new normal level. Mm -hmm. Level, but. It, because if you have like a really high up standards, you need to make compromises. Yes, you, it, it's like a, you can't can't or like the the yeah. yeah. So how you choose like yeah. which ones? <laughs> yeah, you're right. There is. I, th I think you're right that there is a balance as well. Because if you make mm -hmm. and this is where step changes are good in regulation. That also mm -hmm. if, the, if the housing industry, building industry knows where we need to get to in five years, mm -hmm. and then we loads of steps to the regulations to get to that. I think that's also important because while I'm saying we need to be ambitious, the problem is we can't suddenly expect a complete shift in meeting that ambition um, because that then, you know, the industry isn't ready for that. So I think these step changes to get to then the 
ambitious level is really important. And then it's just then choosing where do you, because we know it's not enough and we want to get to the top level, but how do we enable the industry to get to the other level? And also that culture change that Katja talks about, because of course I'm focusing on the attitude and culture change of us as architects, but of course it's actually endemic across the whole industry. And, and, and of course we're, we're part of that. So it's of course we ha can have persuasive arguments, the more knowledge we have, the more we can point out and take people with us in that vision. Um, but it is still always very hard work and this barrier. So ideally it is the whole um, industry that, that is part of that culture change and, and can achieve, um, we can achieve a lot more this way. It comes back to that collaborative uh, process. Um, yeah. Yeah, so no easy answers, I'm aware, unfortunately. Um, Katja, could I ask you, I think, I'm just sort of mulling over this as well, I actually really like, because I didn't frame it like that, but I really like how you framed, um, you know, with the holistic design that um, sort of, that we need to uphold high standards in all, that it's absolutely right, and I like how you frame about the equality issue, because if we do think that if, if, if we don't put us humans as the most important thing, but also biodiversity at the same level and resources and uh, people miles, thousands of miles away in the world that we impact, our, our actions impact other people elsewhere, that I think it is very interesting way of looking at it also holistic. I don't particularly like the word holistic, but I can't find a better word for it. But looking at it as a broader thing, as you say, there is either really localized inequalities, you know, it's either affordability or health and well-being, or um, you know, and, and there's always something we trade off. But there's actually also other inequalities with other species and biodiversity, and and the trees we cut down, or then the water cycle that actually we ruin, and and even miles away when we're importing resources and so on. So I really like thinking of it that way about. Um, about um, yeah, the equality as part of these responsibilities, because you're saying it very explicitly so, and, and I might borrow that, I might steal that next time, if you don't mind. Because um, I, I do think it's a, it's a, it is exactly what, what I'm saying, but it's actually that one term covers that quite richly so, I think. I think it does so, and it's, yeah. it's, uh, you can find really like uh, concrete issues about it, such as, for instance, the daylight uh, yeah. properties in apartments, which you uh, mentioned in the first part and which we have been also discussing a lot yeah. uh, in, in the housing um, committee or what, what was yeah. the uh, word. And, 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 and uh, it, it really be becomes an issue when, when affordability or the, the really deep uh, buildings without uh, uh, good natural light mm -hmm. in the apartments is, is sort of justified okay but we we have to uh, the prices are too high we have to build homes for those who can't afford the large yeah, yeah. 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 but then they're healthy that we are uh, ready to 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 sort of uh, take away daylight from yeah. those who can't yeah. pay yeah. Uh, Horrible. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so it's, it's really a concrete issue, but yeah. of course, uh, when you think about it more, more like uh, widely, then then uh, like the biodiversity uh, problems they touch probably most those in the global south and and in and the really like uh, in the regions that that suffer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Al al already yeah. previously from inequality and, and, and even more so. And, and in, in many, many levels, I think it, it really connects the, the different mm -hmm. pairs. And maybe circling back to what you just said, I think I probably could have drawn it out a little bit clearer in the first talk, because um, even if you think of the equality issues, for example, if you stick with daylight, right, that not only are we saying that if you don't have the, the cash or the loan that you can get to buy an apartment of a certain type, then you can afford this shitty one with bad daylight, right? And, and great, but actually in the long term, they will pay more bills and their health and well-being suffers. And, but I think if we, again, if we go back to us as architects or the client, if we, if we make it part of our practice to go back and check 
what do users think of these units? What, when we get a satisfaction survey and we check the energy bills, then we might actually understand that we're designing for real people. Are we okay designing places that some people are saying it's fantastic, it's great, and then those that are in the units with very bad daylighting really actually suffer? And that, you know, if we have sort of how do buildings work in reality, if we include that, process, we might stop thinking of this as acceptable at the point of sale, but actually that it has implications beyond the point of sale. So often again, as architects, we stop sort of like the keys get handed over, the building's finished, that's all we worry about. But actually, if part of our process is much more, uh, again, circular, we go back, we check that feeds back and we learn from it, then we also realize you know, I just spoke with residents, I live in a building I've designed, and actually it's true, the daylight should, but hey, they can afford the apartment, are we okay with that, you know? So I think if we ourselves see that we don't just stop our responsibility at the moment the building or the users move in, that actually we still have a responsibility to the users after, then that also, I think, connects through, and I don't think I made that incredibly clear, because there's still sort of these points are sort of, the three points I was making are sort of disconnected, but actually they're all very much connected, of course. Um, as well with, you know, the lifespan of the building beyond and the use beyond and, and users' health and well-being. Um, yeah. I, I hear that, <clears throat> like, sustainability has two sides. It's like the ecological side of things, like sustainability and ecological side, and then the, like, social sustainability. Sustainability is often go, like, hand-to-hand hand to hand yeah. in in the in our yeah. our society um like what i make of all of these what we have talked about in your your mini lectures lectures is that we should always start start by making like the sust sustainability should come first and then we should uh like design by it and with it with it and not like adding it on top of the building like it's exactly. yeah. paint or roof or something like that yeah and that i think that comes with the social social aspect as well mm -hmm. as Absolutely. well so yeah. we everybody can design like affordable housing if that it's like a, the market says so that you can so the sustainable sustainable choices aren't not that expensive if you start no. yeah ex that's exactly it and i think yeah coming back to that point thank you for bringing that out this sort of social aspects and the ecological or environmental aspects and we got the economic aspects that mm -hmm. we've done the social so therefore it's eco it's a sustainable building or oh mm -hmm. we've done the energy but we don't really think about the people who are going to go move in it and how they use the building and if it would work for them and we didn't include them but it's still sustainable and we can no longer say any of those things unless we actually do cover these high standards and have considered things across. Um, it's like a triangle, you know, you yeah. all have this triangle, like fast, inexpensive and great quality. And you can choose like two of them. Yeah. <laughs> we have this social aspect, yeah. economical aspect and environmental aspect, and we should be able to choose all three of them at the yes. same time. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly, exactly that. Yeah, yes. The biggest thing is is how we're going to actually achieve that in reality, and it does also make me wonder because I'm not yet a SAFA member. I need to sort out my qualifications and get things. <laughs> so, but um, I did wonder whether also this whole issue of, and I don't know how SAFA work in that sense, but actually whether we can also do much more outreach to others in the industry because I do think architects are one of the few professions that have a very good general overview of all of the issues in construction. We're not necessarily an expert on many things, but we, we know a lot about many things and we have quite a good lateral overview of the construction process and the, the design process and the different players, whether that we can use that to our strength to influence some of that debate uh, in the rest of the industry. Um, I don't know how we go about that, but, but yeah, I mean, the great thing about Finland being a small country is that, um, you know, everybody knows everybody. So well, yes, there, it's a small no barrier, really. Yeah, it's a smaller community, but also I think you can um, you can be more effective with change mm. too, because you can you it's, it's sort of you know not a debate that sort of takes months or years to reverberate across if you there's ten ten times more people and more architects and so on. 
So I think we should also use that to our benefit, actually, of it being a quite intimate community um, as architects, but also in the rest of the building industry that um, I think could be quite exciting. Great. Uh, now I'd like to ask if somebody has something, some comments or anything like that. I think I promised that this would last about an hour and now yeah. we have an hour and seven minutes. Yeah. So we still have a little bit more time if somebody wants to comment or or give some pointers or anything. And they can also always contact me as well via email or on social media. I have one question. Ooh, ooh. By Nora? Oh. Yes. <laughs> I can maybe read it out loud. Yeah. I was left wondering about seeing ourselves as architects, as global citizens or members of local communities. How do we strive towards this? What could be the steps? I think education has a role in this, but it's a tricky path. An architect is a profession, but it's also, at least in some way, an identity and a culture that sometimes closes others outside. So how to make this barrier between architects and people maybe softer mm. in life or better mm. word. yeah and i'm sure katya might want to say something as well thanks nora i think yeah it's, it's sort of getting really to the essence isn't it of of our profession in many ways because it's that identity and that sort of um maybe elite isn't the right word but we do we are quite um uh, sort of in close circle and we clo we, we we sort of um uh in, it's not that we deliberately exclude other people, but it is exclusive club of architects, right? And um, and I'm not saying that that's, that shouldn't be the case. I'm saying that it can be really bad. And I think for sustainability, it has been quite bad because we then haven't really thought outside the box. And I think, um, first of all, education, I completely agree. For me, it's actually getting people to think in a different way about architecture is, you know, that as part of the design process, it's also actually um, having a bigger question or a bigger meaning to projects that we do and not just because it looks good and how we make decisions. So I think edu in education, it's very important to, to instill these lifelong learning skills of the critical thinking, reflective thinking, placing ourselves as a global citizen. And at the university, at Dunbar University, we're starting a new sustainable architecture course, and we're very much looking at including global citizenship discussions. But then I think, uh, as for architects in practice, I really then encourage you to join local initiatives. Like you got uh, Demos Helsinki. There's the Untitled Festival next month, although I think it's also mostly online now. Um, but also, um, for example, Architects Climate Action Network, so that you actually start. Um, getting or choosing to be exposed to people who are also asking similar questions and are seeing themselves as global citizens and don't know how to bring that into their architecture but can start those discussions and that you can actually share those experiences as well when you're an architect in practice um, because that's how we can then exchange knowledge but exchange views and experiences and and you know how we can change the culture together um, but I think it is about also realizing that we do have that broader responsibility um, to not only our fellow human beings, but to other species on the planet and that our architecture influences that and not just being foremost the architect, but that bring that personal issue into it. So, and it could maybe the best example is a little bit, um, I think Bipsa, you refer to it with the pandemic, right? That now when we're designing homes, I think a lot of us will question is that the right kind of plan? It's a bit small. Do we really want a bedroom with no window, you know, so that we maybe are thinking about our architecture in different ways. And perhaps that's the starting point as well, that we actually are more reflective on our practice and think of the future, the longer term, and that this isn't just a job or another project, but it has real impact on people and the planet. Um, but other than that, I don't have any real solutions. I just surround myself to challenge myself and keep thinking fresh about these things through networks like that, um, to hear from fellow architects who are also activists. That's, that's a horrible word in a way, but, um, but you know, it's uh, it's sort of people who actually want to make a difference, want to make a change. Um, yeah. I was thinking that it's it's really so easy to think in silos and and to, to yeah. sort of place yourself and your expertise in a silos. And, and others in in different silos and and, and one uh, 
problem in Finland is maybe that we have been quite long sort of been focusing in defending our silo. Not just in Finland, yeah. And, and in, in that we yeah. sort of maybe are in danger of not seeing that if we would open up ourselves for learning, we would actually be yeah. able to gain a bigger yeah. or more meaningful role in the whole, yeah. whole sort of ecosystem. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that really should be more strongly uh, put forward. Not, not to stick to the, this is what we do and this is what the, the thinking that we want to defend, but to, to be able to, to open for this uh, learning from others. And, and of course, it is mentally really uh, tough and messy. And, and yes. So yeah. you can't really uh, yeah. beforehand where it ends up, but it, it yeah, it has to be done. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. It's messy, but it's necessary. And I do think I agree with you, Katja. And it's not just Finland. I think architects throughout the world have seen a decline in their power on projects and their role. And then you know we've had more and more experts take over loads of other bits, and we've really tried to very carefully hang on to the bits that we have but because of that we've also created this identity that we're not very open-minded that we only do very narrow kind of things and actually what I'm I guess I'm saying is we should get involved where do we make the biggest difference we should get involved in these things particularly if we have the expertise broaden our knowledge but particularly also then work and embrace people doing these things together because there is very few um, other professions I can think of that are trained the way architects are which is the way of thinking about the world and that design thinking and that lateral thinking and the fact we have this overview of so many things that many others don't have. So, you know, you don't find an engineer, who's usually a civil engineer, who also does a mechanical and electrical uh, engineering. You know, that's already an expertise, right? So we have this huge lateral overview and, and understand how project works. And, and we're also the ones that actually really tend to bring people back into our projects. So I think we should celebrate those things and, and and bring other people into it, collaborate, it's messy, but maybe hang on less to our design role only, but within that then take on the design role. But it's of course easier said than done because we do operate in that bigger culture that is so hard, which is again what Nora was referring to, which is so hard to get out of and sort of it's quite exclusive club. And we quite like it because we studied five years at least to, <laughs> to get to here, you know. So we, we also quite like being able to say, I'm an architect, you worked hard for it. So yeah. Laura right, is now saying that thanks for comments and thoughts. Our architect culture is a positive thing for sure, but I've been wondering how we could encourage opening up and teaming up with others who are interested in the same questions as we are. Maybe we should concentrate more on the common goals than who are the exactly people. absolutely yeah so, exactly it's the people that we're together going to make a difference and it doesn't matter if it's an architect who's a technical architect or a design architect or an engineer or a landscape architect or the client um you know it's as a team we deliver and we need that expertise as a team and that brainstorming and how to do it is as i said email me Get involved if we can set up Architects Climate Action Network. It's not just actually for architects, it's just the architects started it in London. Um, several of my students are involved, that's how I'm sort of aware of it. And, um, and we're trying to actually bridge across the Nordic region and also the Baltic region. And so far there's about 25, uh, mostly I, I would say 70% Finnish uh, colleagues are keen to, to see how we can team up and, and collaborate and make a difference and uh, together. I think now it's about the time to like get in the last pieces you want to say and and I already finished my wine so it's maybe time I to... have a little left. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small pub, it's just pips on me or maybe there's everybody who's not got their video on is all nicely in the garden. Yeah. Do you have some like closing closing words or or anything else you want to say? 
say for still? Me, um, I think I've said a lot already. <laughs> no, I mean, I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity to reach out with colleagues across the country and to start a dialogue because I don't think that there's easy answers and there's not always right or wrong answers as well. It's also, um, you know, very specific to, you know, the work that people do here. So I hope that we can continue having a discussion about this because it's the only way how we're going to make a change. This is not going to happen by one professor uh, at one university. We need a group of people um, that can really steam ahead and, and brainstorm and, and I think if we can just stay open-minded about some of these things and, and be a global citizen, uh, I think, and change, you know, our culture, I, I think that's really crucial. Katya, if you wanted to wrap up anything. No? Okay. Thank you, Katya, for, for coming up really nicely. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, everybody else. Katya and, and all the people who are probably watching this from their homes as I've got the recordings on the website. Yeah, and thank you for the next thing. For organizing. Yeah. No problem. On Lopua, everybody. Have a lovely weekend. Sun is going to shine. Start, sun is still shining here in Dampere. Um, yeah. And I hope to meet some of you in, for real in, you know, in face to face at some stage, maybe at the next Safa seminar, you never know. Mm. Um, but yeah, and do get in touch if you're interested to discuss more, collaborate, or you never know. But hopefully we cross paths. And thank you again for the invitation. Uh, thanks so much.